Welcome back to the shop. I'm Jason, and today we are working on another shop project. So recently I picked up a new air compressor so that I could do some powder coating. That new air compressor, while it puts out a ton of air, it also puts out a ton of hot air. Up at the top of the head and the outlet of the air, I'm getting like 270 to 300 degrees which then goes into the tank, condenses, builds up a lot of water vapor, gets stuck in the bottom of the tank. Some of that, if I'm sandblasting, makes it out into my dryer system, past that into the dryer system on my sandblaster, and it's just a mess. So I'm doing what everybody else is doing, and I'm gonna use the Durail 15300 that I picked up on Amazon. This is a tube and fin cooler with 16 passes. You come in one side, and it goes across 16 times, comes out the bottom. From there, I'll run into an initial air water separator before the air goes into the tank. Then it'll come out of the tank and into my current dryer system. I'm hoping that by cooling it off, that will condense the moisture into the bottom of this guy. This is an automatic drain. So then when the compressor shuts off and it seals up that side of the circuit through the one-way check valve, all the moisture will drain out before it gets into my desiccant or any other part of the system. So what we need to do is first, I'm gonna drain the air out of the tank, pull it away from the wall, and then we need to start bending up some line to get to the cooler that I'm gonna mount on the back. Now, I thought of trying to get complicated with this and build a bracket that I could weld onto the tank and yada, 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 and I thought, I just want it to work. It's gonna get pushed up into the corner. So I had these uh, auxiliary mount or fan mount zip ties essentially from a build on my M5 when I did an electric fan on that, but I built a shroud for it and I didn't need these. So I'll use them on this. Should make this much easier. First things first, before I can start bending any lines or routing anything, gotta figure out where we're gonna mount this. This cooler is smaller than the fan, and this fan puts out a lot of air. So I feel like it's gonna pull quite a bit of air through this without inhibiting cooling the head all that much. What I want is I want just a little bit of clearance on the top and the bottom. So I'm just gonna mark the top, and then I want the fittings, drop and paint everywhere, jeez. I want the fittings to hang out the side here, and then I'll bend them from there, I think. The belt guard on mine, is just held on with these sheet metal screws. I'm also adding this rigid foam to the face of the core, and I'm gonna go all the way around the core here to make sure that as it's pushing up against this metal grate that I'm not getting any wear on it. This foam is two-sided, so I can stick it down Make sure I'm getting everybody to stay in place. And on this side, we have another piece of foam. Push that down. And then we have our one-way clips that hold everything in place. Before I go tight, I'm gonna make sure that on this side, it's lined up. Squeeze that down tight. Anybody else make the mistake of trying to film whenever your neighbor's landscapers are here? Most of my neighbors have landscapers. I have kids, they're my landscapers. Seems like I'm always filming to the sound of a weed eater or a blower. So before we start taking the fill tube off, I just wanna clarify something. This cooler does not have one half inch flare fittings on it. What it has is 8AN flare fittings, which are a 37 degree flare where a normal HVAC flare housing flare is 45 degrees. I'm gonna give it a shot because there's still going to be metal contacting here and I just gotta seal the air off while it's pumping. So maybe it'll work. If it doesn't, you need an 8AN adapter to a uh, whatever size you wanna run on this side. I'm gonna try the half inch flare.
Okay, you want to run a hard line off of the compressor head because you are seeing 300 degree temperature. I'm not going to run copper. I bought a roll of aluminum because it was cheaper. Let's hope that it works just as well. Now this is going to be my first time ever bending hard line like this. This is a test bend that I did. I'm using this bender that I got off of Amazon. Links to everything down below. You know how that works. And I already flared this side. I think I flared it a little big because the nut, you have to kind of screw over top of the flare, but we're gonna give it a shot. So what I want is I wanna come off of here and just loop over straight into there. This side, we have to run a compression fitting. This side, we run a flare. We're gonna cut it right there this time. Okay, now we need this to fit inside here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a deburr tool. So I'll deburr the inside, and then I'll deburr the outside. We're just trying to get a nice smooth fitting for that compression to sink down in there. It's actually not gonna sink into here, it'll sink into this side. I did get some tube inserts. I don't think that's gonna be necessary in this case though. Though, I might try it anyhow. So I've got a compression tube on the inside. I've got my compression sleeve on the outside and then the nut. Don't flare before you put the nut on. That's a mistake. So I decided to use the little bracket that came with my water separator here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill and tap the base and mount it just like this. Now that we're pretty solidly mounted, we can double check this line. I went ahead and bent another one because my last one was kind of wackadoodle. I think this one is actually gonna work much better. So I did a 180 and then a 90, which was a little difficult to get done. Got a little bit of kinking here, but now I can just trim this section off. The smoother the inside of your fitting here, the smoother that flare will wind up being as you tighten it down. So when you put your piece in to flare it, you definitely don't want a ton sticking out. You want, they, they say about a millimeter sticking out over the top, which honestly isn't that much. Then you lock it down. And this flare is actually a self-seating. So inside the cone is a wobble cone. And on the top side here, it has a torque spec. So as I crank it down, it will give right there when it's torqued so that you don't over flare and crush your fitting. And because we cleaned it up really nice, We've got a nice polished edge there to get a good seal on here. And then I'll clean that edge on the outside up just a little bit, smooth everybody out. It looks like it's gonna work pretty good to cut right there and get everybody lined up. Technically, there's a whole lot of math you could put into this and where you wanna start the bend and where the bend's gonna finish. Realistically, you could just do all of this by hand without one of these and just eyeball it. But my dad is planning to install a mini split fairly soon and I'm gonna be helping with the install and we're gonna need to shorten up some lines and move stuff around. So I thought I'd better start getting a little bit of practice with this. So I have my die right there and I can see that if I bend it, it's gonna go a little too tight. So I'm gonna line up with my mark. I'm gonna come back. I'm just gonna start bringing this down. And slowly unravel this as I bring it down.
Then I'll straighten it out and we'll turn in right here. Look at that, just spin it right into place. Remember, push your tube down and in as you're tightening to make sure it's down far enough to get the flare, not the flare, the compression nut to seat. Crow's foot sure would be nice right here. I just don't have any standard crow's feet. Comment below, are these compression fittings to AN fittings gonna leak? Let's see who's right. Got everything in and in place. Close the tank. And... Well, we got a leak right there. No leak there. Small leak right here. And small leak down here. So, whoo, that is too hot to touch already. Let's back it off a smidge. Go a smidge tighter. Definitely on there. Okay, so were you right? Did you say the fittings were gonna leak or that they weren't gonna leak? Because technically everybody was right. I had one fitting leak, one fitting not leak. And as soon as I tightened up that one on the bottom, no more leaks. I do have a tiny, tiny leak coming into the one-way valve here, but for now, I'm gonna be okay with that. I'm gonna let it run through a number of cycles. That way I can recheck everything. Now, as far as burning the crap out of my arm, the air coming into the upper side of the cooler was hitting over 300 degrees. The air coming out of the bottom of the cooler, 88 degrees. It was actually coming out of the cooler at a lower temperature than our ambient right now. It's about 105-ish degrees. Outside, my walls are right around 99 degrees in the shade. My tank is about 99 to 100 degrees ambient temperature. I can't get the tank any cooler than the air around it. My shop, as you go in, is a little bit cooler because of that noisemaker behind the camera, my swamp cooler, and it's sitting at 86 degrees inside the shop right now. As it was running, I didn't catch it on film, but this thing was spurting psh, 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 over and over and over again because it was catching so much water. I did get a little bit of water out of my bottom tank drain valve, but I don't know if that was just sitting in the bottom of the tank, if it's not perfectly flat or round down to the drain or what that looks like. So I'm gonna have to test it a little bit more to make sure that this is conclusively pulling out all of the water or some of the water. I'm actually okay with some of it as long as it's better going over to my dryer here on the wall because I don't wanna be going through desiccant so quickly. I am gonna try to rebake the desiccant that I have. That's this stuff here. It says that you can bake it and rechargeable. I'm gonna try that. For now, that worked really, really well. There is a significant amount of airflow being pulled through there from this fan. It's still coming through, even with that obstruction on the back, and it's dropping the temperature 200 degrees. I was literally reading 300 degrees at the top, 88 on the bottom. That's significant. I think it's gonna make a big difference in the operation of this unit, the longevity of my tank, as well as the longevity of my tools that I'm dealing with that don't want water in them, such as when I'm powder coating, sandblasting, uh, well, any of my air tools, they don't want water in them either. So I think this was a great upgrade, well worth the cost and investment in time. You could go and get these lines made up by say a hydraulic shop out of some stainless steel braided line or something like that. You do need this upper line to be temperature sensitive. That one has to be able to take at least 300 degrees, probably more, depending on the environment that you're in. Wow, this made a big difference. I hope that it is inspiring for you to do something like this. It's fairly simple and entirely worth it. Thanks for watching. Okay, if you made it to this point, wow, good job. I've got the real world update from two weeks after installing the cooler. I have been using exclusively just air tools for the past two weeks instead of all of my little electric ones. That way I can get this thing put through as much use as possible. I've also powder coated the brakes on my 540. I finished the powder coating on the valve covers that I was working on mid project when I did this. And I've done a ton of sandblasting 
Did it pull all the water out? Nope, it did not pull all the water out. It pulled probably 90 to 95% of the water out because I am still getting some condensation up here in my primary desiccant. However, when the air would get to my sandblaster, I have another dryer on there, I did not get any moisture in the sandblaster desiccant. Didn't have to change it, didn't have to do anything. And this one still has some charge to it, which tells me I'm getting far less moisture up there. I am getting moisture in my bucket down here. I had to have this hose on here and a bucket to drain into because there was enough moisture coming out that it was draining all over the place. And I didn't like that. It's so hot out here though, that it just evaporates out of the bucket. That works fantastic. I also did not drain the bottom of the tank, which as you very well know, is not something good for your tank. But I did that as a experiment here. I let it sit in here for the last two weeks while I was running this thing. And then I drained it last night. I did not get that much moisture out of the bottom of the tank. There was moisture, however, after two weeks of condensing and sitting in here, I got a bunch of rusty, semi-oily water out of the bottom. It was really easy to clean up off of the floor, which tells me there's not much oil, but there's a ton of rust. That tells me the inside of these tanks are not finished in any way, it's just bare steel. So that is why you have to drain them either with an automatic drain or regularly drain the bottom of the tank. Even if you have a cooler set up, there's gonna be something. I also tested out the theory of this rechargeable silica. I threw it in an oven on a baking sheet at 250 for all of like 15 minutes and it turned back into nice bright purple. Now I did have some non-rechargeable silica mixed in here that I've been saving. I've just been dumping it all back into a jar and it didn't fully recharge, but I'm gonna use this separate as I recharge or I save the silica out of my other two dryers, I'll put them in a new jar and then as this wears out, I'll dump it. Real world update, it works. Is it perfect? No. But in our very warm, my shop, very humid environment because of my swamp cooler, it's working fantastic. I did have one failure. Remember this was leaking up here at the one-way check valve end of the tank. That line started leaking worse and worse and I tightened it and I tightened it and it, it blew itself right off of there. I must have crimped the aluminum. When I had the leak originally, I pulled the fitting off and I could see that the ferrule was a little bit sideways. And I think what that did was it was just cutting into the aluminum and then the vibration allowed it to break. I cut it, rebent it a little bit, put a new ferrule on there. And so far it's been good and leak free. Learning lesson for me, I probably should have just gone the extra expense and bought the copper. It would have been stronger, but lesson learned. I have another, I don't know, six, eight feet of this. So if anything breaks, I'll just bend a new line. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate you. I'll see you in the next one.